Welcome to the International Broadcast Ministry of Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. Here at Touching Lives, our mission is to touch the lives of the lost and enrich the faith of the found. And now, here is pastor, author, and speaker, Dr. James Merritt. So here's what we're going to do today. I'm, I'm a fan, I don't know about you, but I'm a fan of detective shows. I, I, I watch Forensic Files, I watch Dateline, I just kind of get into that stuff. And, and so this story is something that really fascinated me. I didn't know it, but over a century ago, on September the 19th, 1910, at 2 o'clock in the morning, a man named Clarence Hiller wrote, woke up to the screams of his wife and daughter and he knew something was wrong because there had been a spate of robberies in the Chicago neighborhood where he lived. And so he jumps out of bed and, and, and he races out the door and he runs right into the robber at the head of the stairs. Well, they, they fall down the staircase. They tumble down the staircase. You hear a little bit of commotion. And then three shots ring out. And so neighbors come running from all over the place and they find Hiller dying at the front door. Now, the killer didn't make it far. His name was Thomas Jennings. He had actually been paroled six weeks earlier, and he was stopped about a half mile away, he had on a torn bloody coat, was carrying a revolver. But it was what he left behind that would be the focal point of his trial and would actually change judicial history and forensic investigations forever. Because Mr. Hiller, the day before, had just painted a stair railing in his house, and the fresh paint was still on it, and they found a fingerprint on that railing. So they took a picture of it, they cut off the railing, and they said this would prove the identity of the burglar. So in the eyes of the court, they decided they were right. And Hiller was convicted of first degree murder, and it was the first conviction in the history of, judi uh, of judicial investigation using fingerprint evidence in a trial, trial in the United States. And ever since that time, now we know one thing above everything else. You may not have an eyewitness, you may not be on camera, but if your fingerprint is found somewhere, you were there. If they find a fingerprint and it's your fingerprint, it means you've been there. So we're in a series, if you're a guest of ours today, we've been calling I Doubt It, and we've been dealing with some of the top doubts that Christians have and skeptics have, non-Christians and you know believers about faith and about life. And last week, we dealt with this doubt, well, is the Bible really the Word of God or not? So what we're going to do today is we're all going to play detective. And what we're going to do is we're going to dust for fingerprints. We're going to consider the evidence and the proof for why the Bible not only has God's fingerprints, but, and we ought to believe and believe, you know, be believed and trusted, but what about God himself? I mean, what about the people who honestly doubt not just the Word of God, they doubt the God of the Word? What about people, maybe some of you in this room, and you're not even really sure there's a God out there. Maybe you're absolutely convinced this all just happened by evolutionary chance. We're just a product of accidental nature. And so, you know, in fact, I don't want you to raise your hand, but I'd be interested to know how many of you ever at least at some time in your life doubted that there even is a God? If you hooked me up to a lie detector test, if I told you I never doubted God existed, I'd flunk it. Because you're looking at a pastor that's been times you wonder whether it's a fleeting thought or a doubt you have. I mean, is there really anybody up there? And you say, well, boy, I can't believe that, that you would admit that as a pastor. Well, I don't know why, because faith presupposes doubt. As a matter of fact, the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's worse than that. Without faith, it's impossible to know God. The, the only, I mean, I've never touched God. I've never, I've never heard God speak out loud. I've never seen what God looks like. I've never tangibly, you know, been around him, though I absolutely believe in him. So if you're one of those, you say, wow, well, I, I've got doubts too. I mean, don't be embarrassed. I told you last week, some of the greatest people in the Bible were champion level doubters. I mean, Job, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, David, even the ring leader of the disciples, Peter, even Peter had his doubts. Well, I came across a verse of Scripture. I'd never noticed this before. And, and I want you to listen to what an author named Jude, it's, it's, it's the next to the last book uh, in the Bible. But this author said something, and I never, ever, ever, ever thought about it. Jude doubted 
Jesus was raising the dead. He was one of the doubters. He doubted at one time that Jesus even was the Son of God. And this is what he wrote about doubt. Listen to this. He said, be merciful to those who doubt. I thought, what a refreshing word. Because too often the church has not been real merciful. Too often the church has told people who doubt, shh, 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 shh. Don't, we don't want to hear it. Sweep it under the rug. Pretend you really don't have that doubt. Well, that's not what Jude said. Jude said we ought to be gentle with doubters. And, and, and we ought to, you know, we ought to be, you know, gentle with doubters who still believe and believers who doubt. So if you're one of those people and you really are doubting, even maybe today that there even is a God, or maybe at some time in your life or sometime down the road you may doubt, I mean, is there even a God up there? Then you've come to the right place and you're going to hear, I hopefully, the right sermon. Now, before I get started, let me burst one bubble. I want to freely admit, I cannot prove the existence of God. I can't prove it. I cannot prove the existence of a supernatural, invisible being we call God. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. If you're an atheist, you can't prove the unexistence of God. You cannot prove, you know, that, there, that, that God does not exist. But here's the best news for me. If you don't believe there is a God, and I do believe there is a God, and we're going to present the facts, I have a whole lot easier case than you have to make. It's going to be a lot harder for you to prove to me there is no God than me to try to prove to you that there is a God. Let me tell you why. There was a man named Mortimer Adler, Abner. He observed, I never thought about this. He said, while it's possible to prove an affirmative proposition, such as God does exist, he said, while it's possible to prove that, uh, uh, that uh, proposition, it is impossible to prove a negative proposition that God doesn't exist. And I thought, well, why? And then he gave this example. So I want you to imagine somebody comes up to you and they say, you know, I believe somewhere, some way, somehow, there's such a thing as a red eagle. A red eagle does exist somewhere. And then suppose that, that, that uh, someone else says, oh, no, 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 no. Red eagles don't exist. I mean, I'm just telling you right now, take my word for it. They don't exist, okay? Now, let's take the first person. He says a red eagle does exist, okay? All that guy's got to do is find one red eagle, and he's done. But if you say, oh, no, 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 there are no red eagles anywhere at all, guess what you got to do? You got to go to every corner of the universe to prove there is no red eagle. You, so I, the, the positive proposition is a lot easier to prove than the negative proposition. So here we're going to get down to the nitty gritty. When it comes down to whether or not God exists, the issue is not about proving that so much one way or the other. Here's the only question we can raise and answer. Where does the evidence lead us? Are there any fingerprints? Is there any good proof out there that would make me think, yes, there is a God that created this universe? Because I think one thing we'd all agree on this morning. If there is a God, and if God created all of this, we ought to see some evidence of it. I mean, I don't know who the builder was that built my house. I know there was a builder. I got the evidence. Told you last week there was not an explosion at Home Depot when it just happened. Uh, there, somebody built it, somebody designed it, somebody came up with it, somebody built it. Well, the same thing ought to be true. If God, if you're up there and you really built all this, and you really created, created all this, we ought to be able to find some trace of your existence. And by the way, no less than the most prolific writer in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, said exactly the same thing. In Romans chapter 1, here's what he said. Listen to this. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now watch now. Since what may be known about God is plain to them. He stops right there. Take the most wicked, vile people on the planet. And Paul said, there is all the evidence you could ever ask for. God has made himself plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Long before we had microscopes and telescopes and astronomy and modern science, Albert Einstein said, and I'm quoting, you look at this world and you will see outstanding evidence for God. Now, Albert Einstein was a pretty smart guy. 
And he said, look, you just look at this world and you're going to see outstanding evidence for God. And I'm going to show you today why I believe that's true. And I'm going to show you today why I believe he knew what he was talking about. So in short, there is no reason to say no to the God you can know. There's no reason to say no to the God you can know. So let's get out. Let's, we're all going to play detective today. We're all Columbo, all right? Some of you remember Columbo. We're all going to be Columbo. Let's dust for fingerprints. Let's just see. So what is the evidence that there has to be a God out there that made all this? I'm going to say three things today. So listen, this is important. I'm not trying to impress you, and that's not the purpose. I never try to do that. But I'm telling you, you're going to see, I have busted it on this message. And my concern, my concern is you get lost in the weeds. Just hang with me, okay? Because what you're going to read and hear is just fascinating, all right? Three things. Number one, God's fingerprints are on the physical world. God's fingerprints are on the physical world. Now, we're in Psalm 19. I want to show you a verse of Scripture that was written by a man named David about 3,000 Years ago, by the way, C.S. Lewis called the 19th Psalm the greatest poem in the Psalms and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. Because the Psalm is really, really simple. What, God, what David's going to tell us in this little 19th Psalm is real simple. God has spoken loudly enough that everybody can hear him. And God has shown himself clearly enough that everybody can see him. You don't have to look very far. He said, matter of fact, all you got to do is look up. You want to believe there's a God or not, just look up. So he says in Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. So David begins by saying, the entire universe is like this gigantic billboard where God is announcing 24-7, I'm here, I I'm here. You don't have to look any further. I'm, I'm, I'm right here. Well, billboards don't just happen. And neither did the heavens, or the skies, or the galaxies, or the planets. As for example, there was a time when people thought the world had always existed. Aristotle believed that. Plato believed that. The ancient Greeks believed that. They believed there was a, that, that matter was eternal, that it's just always been here. And then scientists came along and said, wait a minute, that's not true. We look at a universe that is expanding. And because it's expanding, it must have had a beginning. Now, scientists call that the Big Bang. You can call it whatever you want to. But we now know that anything that has a beginning has to have a cause. Because if there is no God, then either something came from nothing, right? So if there's no God, either all this came from nothing, which we know is impossible, or something that had a beginning, the universe, exists without a cause. But we know that's impossible. Anything that, had, that exists today had a beginning. Now, let me just stop right there. You say, okay, I'm buying that, but I'll concede something. Does that prove that this is the God of the Bible? No, nope, that doesn't prove that the God or whoever created this is the God of the Bible. But what we now know is somebody or something did. But then you start digging deeper and, and you begin to really study how complex this universe is. And the evidence just gets stronger and stronger and stronger, which is exactly what David said. He says in verse two, Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. And yet, their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. That word pour forth is a beautiful Hebrew word. It literally means to gush out. And what David was saying was, if we just look up, the skies are gushing evidence for God like a waterfall, declaring the power and the glory and the reality of God. He says, by the way, have you noticed day follows night, night follows day. There's an order, there's a symmetry, there's a harmony to the universe that can only be the work of a divine hand. And oh, by the way, it's not just how we got here that lets me know there has to be somebody up there that created it. It's how we even stay here that's incredible <clears throat> because the probability is right now, can I be honest, we really shouldn't be here today. If you look at just the physical parameters, let me give you an example. Today, scientists tell us there are more than 200 known parameters for a planet to support life. In other words, there are more than 200 scientific events that have to be happening right now or we would not even be here. But it's better than that. 
every single one of them have to be perfectly tuned or the whole thing falls apart. So they did their homework, and here's what they found. Of the 200 variables that have to be happening right now for this earth even to survive, if any of those variables, just take one, if one variable is off by even a million millionth of a fraction, matter would not have been able to unite and hold together. So that means there would have been no stars, no world, no people. There would have been absolutely nothing. See, there's something going on around us in this room right now you don't even realize. Ph physicists call it the constants of physics. There are four physical constants. They never change. The speed of light, the gravitational constant, and the strength of the strong and weak nuclear forces. Now, don't get lost in the weeds. Just listen to this. All of those four things have to have exactly the values that they have in order for life to exist. Well, what is the probability that those four constants remain constant and are at the value that they are? Well, you ready for this? About 10 to the 100th power. 10 to 1, so take a 10, write out 100 zeros, okay? That's about the odds that Florida or Tennessee will win the national championship in the next 30 years, okay? I mean, the odds are just out there. So in other words, with all the possible arrangements of the settings of just those four constants, there's only one in billions of millions of chances they could have even produced life on this planet. Let me give you just one example, one constant that you know about every day, right? Why are you able to sit in your seat without having to hold on to it and float away? It's one word called what? Gravity. gravity. We all know about gravity, right? As you get older, you'll learn what gravity is all about. Look at your tummy, okay? So you've got gravity. Now, physicists tell us that for life to exist on Earth, the force of gra gravity has to remain constant. So, if the gravitational force was altered, listen to this, one part in 10,000 billion, billion, billion. That's one followed by 13 zeros relative to other forces. Life would not exist on planet Earth, by the way. You know we're living on a planet that's moving. You understand that, right? You know you, you understand that. We're not just so we're not just floating in, in, in on you know in outer space. We are moving. So take the speed of planet Earth. Our speed enables us to maintain a stable orbit around the sun so we don't get too close, we burn up, or we get too far away, or we freeze to death. Well, to maintain that distance calls for a very specific speed. Now watch this. If you were to increase Earth's orbital speed, by no more than the square root of two, that's just 1.4 times its current speed. You know what would happen? We would fly right out of the solar system. We'd be destroyed, okay? It's like being on that roller coaster. If you don't have that gravitational force just right, it's gonna ruin your day, right? You're gonna leave those tracks. Same way with planet Earth. It's got to be just right. Now, I barely scratched the surface. I, 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 there's so much stuff I left out of all of this, but the fine tuning of this universe is so incredible that even the atheistic philosopher Stephen Hawking, you've heard of him, Stephen Hawking said this, it would be very difficult to explain why the universe would have begun in just this way except as the act of a God who intended to create beings like us. There was a British philosopher, he died not too long ago. His name was Antony Flew. He was the poster child for atheism for almost 50 years. He was the most celebrated atheist of the last half century. He launched aggressive attack after attack after attack on the existence of God for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, attacked it. Then in 2007, he stunned the world by announcing he had changed his mind. Here's what he said. I now believe that the universe was brought into existence by an infinite intelligence. I believe that this, universe, uh, uh, that this universe's intricate walls manifest what scientists have called the mind of God. I believe that life and reproduction originate in a divine source. How do I believe this, given that I expanded and defended atheism for more than half a century? The short answer is this. This is the world picture, as I see it, a, that has emerged from modern science. Let me put that in real easy language for you to understand. He said, you know what? I found fingerprints. I, I dusted. I saw it. It was there. So I agree with Abraham Lincoln, who said, I can understand how someone might look down at the earth and say there is no God. How can you look up into the heavens and say there is no God? 
Amen, Abe. So, God, it's fingerprints. They're on the physical world. But let's go a little deeper. God's fingerprints on the biological world. Because I want you to do something right now that's going to be real weird. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, you are awesome. <laughs> that hurts my feelings because nobody looked at me and said it, but that's okay. <laughs> One of the greatest evidences that there's a God is what you look at in the mirror every day of your life. You, you don't even understand in another psalm David wrote, you, you can turn to it, Psalm 139. In Psalm 139, David was talking about his body, but what he said about his body is true of every human body. It's true of your body. It's true of mine. He says this in Psalm 139, verse 14. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, I don't want to sound too dehumanizing, but let me tell you what I'm looking at right now all over this room. I'm looking at an incredible machine. I mean an incredible machine. For example, your brain, you ready for this? Your brain can store 100 trillion facts. I know that. I'm married to a woman who can call up any one of them anytime she wants to, okay? Your mind can handle 15,000 decisions a second. I've seen her do it in the mall. Your nose can smell up to 10,000 different odors. Your touch can detect an item one twenty-five thousandth of an inch thick, and your tongue can taste one part of quinine in two million parts of water. That's just, we're just getting started. Think about the incredible, unbelievable complexity of all the information that's encoded just within what we call your DNA. Francis Collins, who's head of the International Home and Genome Project that mapped the entire DNA six of the human being, described it this way. Now, this is a little bit long, but stay with me. The field text, he's talking about your DNA, my DNA. The field text was three billion letters long, written in a strange and cryptographic four-letter code. Such is the amazing complexity of the, human, of the information carried within each, that's one, each cell of the human body that a live reading of that code at a rate of three letters per second would take 31 years, even if you read all day and all night. Printing those letters out in regular font size on normal bond paper and combining them all together would cause you to have to build a tower the height of the Washington Monument. These are the instructions contained in the amazing script called DNA for building one human being. And that's just in one cell, just one cell. By the way, speaking of DNA, you do know that you need more than DNA to have a body. DNA alone, you don't have a body. In fact, lead biologists have discovered a new form of information that's critical to the formation of the human body. Now, don't, do, don't worry about this term, but they call it epigenetic information. That's not stored in DNA. That's stored in cell structures. So now scientists say, you know, in order to build the body that you have, here's what it takes. Now, watch this. DNA to make proteins. Proteins be organized into cell structures and cell types. Cell types be organized into tissues. Tissues to be organized into organs, and organs and tissues to be organized into body plants. And you ask me why I just don't buy into evolution. Are you, are you, seriously. I mean, seriously. Furthermore, do you know what's happening in your body right now? Right now, while I'm talking. You ready for this? This really made me feel a lot better. Right now, while you're sitting there listening to me, trillions of chemical reactions are taking place in every cell of your body every single second. Trillions. Your body is in it. Right now, here's what you're doing. You're inhaling oxygen. You're producing hormones. You're metabolizing energy. You're purifying toxin. You're repairing tissues. You're digesting food. You're exhaling carbon dioxide, and you are circulating blood. While you listen to me stand up here and preach right now, millions of electrical impulses are firing across billions of synaptic pathways. What does that mean? It means I watch a miracle every single Sunday I preach because I can't believe you're staying awake. It wears me out just to realize what's going on in my body, and I'm also preaching. By the way, you're looking at me right now. Well, how are you seeing me? You've got this little organ called the eye. 
Your eye has a retina, which has 130 million receptor cells, 124 million that are rod shaped, and they help us differentiate between light and darkness. Six million of those cells are cone shaped. They can identify up to eight million variations of color. So while you're looking at me, your retina is conducting close to 10 billion calculations a second. Why are you looking at me? Your retina is working overtime just to see what you are seeing, which is why someone suggested, you know, if you're an atheist, just go examine the eye. That's a pretty good cure for atheism. Dr. Wing Mang, you don't know who that is, but it's okay. He's proof of that. Dr. Wing Mang is a world-renowned eye surgeon, earned his MD from Harvard. He's one of the few LASIK surgeons in the world who owns a doctorate in LASIK, LASIK uh, physics. He's performed over 55,000 cataract and LASIK procedures. Dr. Mang grew up in China, steeped in atheism, moves to the United States in 1982. He's at Harvard, then he goes to MIT. But over time, as he studies at Harvard, and he studies at MIT, not the Bible, not listening to messages, just studying the science, over time, he became a Christian. You know why? Here's what he said. As a medical doctor and a scientist, I can firmly attest to the fact it is impossible for natural selection, i.e. evolution. It is impossible for natural selection to form the intricacies of the eye. The very complexity of a human eye is, in, a human eye is in fact the most powerful evidence of the existence of God. Now remember, we're just dusting for fingerprints. I'm just looking at the proof. But then there's a third reason why I believe in God, and there is a God. And that is because God's fingerprints are on the moral world. Not just the physical world, not just the biological world, but the moral world. Because by the way, before Paul mentioned how the creation of the world displays God's power and divine nature, he said this. He says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people, watch this, who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Now, he uses a word there that we're all very, very familiar with. As a matter of fact, we hear about it every day, we read about it every day, we're exposed to it every day, and that word is called wickedness. Uh, Brad Parks, my security guy who works for the whole county sheriff's department, he's working with the GBI. We were back in the green room. We were just talking about, he was just telling me some of the things just happened over the weekend, some of the terrible, gruesome things that happened just over this past week. And it doesn't take long after you're born that you start realizing that, you know, there's some things that are good and there's some things that are wicked and there's some things that are right and there's some things that are wrong. Well, here's the question. Where do you get that idea? Well, where do I get the idea? And how do we choose between what's good and what's wicked, what's right and what's wrong? What standard do we use to judge what's right and what's wrong? What is good and what is wicked? Because if there's no universal objective standard of goodness and right, guess what happens? Morality just becomes a matter of personal opinion. You know, it's so funny. I was, how many of you watch the Super Bowl? How many watch the Super Bowl? All right. Did you see, it was so funny. I, when the guy said it, I thought, you're a moron. The guy gets called for defensive holding. There was a guy at the end of the game. He gets called for defensive holding. Okay, everybody, you kind of, some of you nod your head if you know what I'm talking about, right? God help. Well, it wasn't a big hold. It wasn't a bad hold, but it was a hold. So the referee did the right thing. He calls it. So the, 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 this, this guy that they pay, I don't know, a million dollars a year to say stupid things said, now why would they call that? This is toward the end of the game. Just let them play. You know, you want to go, okay, so... Up until two minutes to go, you got to play by the rules, but after two minutes, you can kick, bite, steal, you know, put a gun to their head. Don't, don't. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. You know why the referee called that? There's an objective standard he has to go by. You grab a jersey and the jersey comes back, that's a hold. I don't care if it's two minutes in the game. If I, now, if, if it's Georgia, maybe it's not a hold. But other than that, it's a hold. It is a hold, right? So the reason why we talk about right and wrong is because we've got this universal standard. Well, where does that come from? Where does that standard of goodness come from? For example, why do soldiers give their lives for their country? Why do they do that? 
Why do powerful people sacrifice money and time and effort and even their lives to save people who are weak and handicapped and dying? Because apart from a God who is good and a God who determines what is good, you know what I expect to be the norm? Racism, sexism, persecution, genocide, pedophilia. As a matter of fact, let me tell you what an atheist says. This is an atheist, Richard Taylor. He makes an honest confession. To say something is wrong because either it is forbidden by God, it is also perfectly understandable to anyone who believes in a law of living God. But to say that something is wrong, even though God exists or forbid it, is not understandable. In other words, he said, if there's a God, I get people saying, that's wrong, that's right. But he said, if there is no God, I don't understand how anybody can say, well, that's wrong and that's right. Because at the end of the day, if that's not true, morality is completely dependent upon your, your personal opinion. But if there's a law-giving God, if there's a good God who has determined what is good and what is wrong, then you've got an objective standard. And only a God who's objectively good and supreme can give that objective standard. See, this is what people don't understand. No government can do that. You know, I mean, communist China, what they say is right. We don't say is right. There are a lot of countries in the world that have laws we would never have in this country. and They break laws we'd never break in this country because they've got a different standard. Government can't do it. Dictators can't do it. A panel can't do it. No politician can do it. Only a perfectly good God can give a perfectly good standard by which all goodness and evil is to be measured. One of my favorite authors is Philip Yancey. He was assigned to a panel on science and faith. And he didn't make a lot of friends, but he said to them, look, I appreciate science and all it's contributed to modern life. He said, but let me just break the news to you. He said, there are three questions that I think are the most important questions for every human being to ask. Science cannot answer. One, why is there something rather than nothing? Number two, why is that something so beautiful and orderly? And number three, how ought we to conduct ourselves in such a world? Great question. So why are you here instead of not here? And why is it that what is here seems to run smoothly? It works. And But more importantly, is how am I supposed to live in this world? Only God can answer those three questions. You can't answer them. I can't answer them. Albert Einstein can't answer them. The president can't answer them. The Senate can't answer them. The Congress can't answer them. No professor can answer them. Only God can answer those questions, which is why in Psalm 14, 1, we read, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. So I want you to remember something. Don't ever forget. If you don't hear anything else in this message, listen to this next statement. Atheists do not have an intellectual problem with God. That's not their problem. They have a moral problem with God. A fool says in his, what's that word? Heart, not head. No, they know better. A fool says in his heart, there is no God. It's not an intellectual problem. It is a moral problem. It's not a head problem. It is a heart problem. I'll give you an example. One of the most famous atheists of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell, was once asked, if you meet God after you die, what will you say to him to justify your unbelief? Here's what he said. I will point my finger at him and say, you, sir, did not give us sufficient evidence. <laughs> Bad grammar, but great theology. That just ain't so. He's left fingerprints everywhere. Augustine was once confronted by a pagan he showed him his idol. And he said, Augustine, here is my God. Where's yours? Augustine said, I cannot show you my God. Not because there is no God to show you, but because you have no eyes to see him. Not because there's no God to show you, but you have no eyes to see him. When the late, great, famous astronaut John Glenn was allowed to fly in the space shuttle Discovery at the age of 77, as they were orbiting the Earth, he looked out the window and he said, to look out at this kind of creation and not believe in God is to me 
impossible. It is to me. I cannot show you, if you're listening to me right now, I cannot show you my God if you have no eyes to see him. But if you want to know whether or not God exists, I'll tell you what you do. Just take out your magnifying glass and just start dusting. Take out your microscope. Take out your telescope. Take out your, your X-ray machines. Take out your MRIs. Go let somebody just examine your eyeball. Just those things. And here's what you'll start seeing. There are divine fingerprints all around you. Oh, no, they're just not fingerprints. These are fingerprints with the power to transform the doubts that you have that have haunted you into a faith that can sustain you all the way to heaven. And by the way, they are the fingerprints of a God who lived a perfect life and died on a cross and came back from the grave and is alive right now as you would expect only God can do. And once you come to, the, come to this man, once you come to this God man, once you come to this Jesus and you really experience him for the first time in your life, he will take care of all of your doubts. Would you pray with me with heads bowed, with eyes closed? I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know who's watching. I don't know who's in this room. But I will just tell you one more thing. If you don't believe in God, you've got a whole lot more faith than I've got. But you understand, you will never get away with saying, well, I don't believe in God because I don't see any evidence. No, no, the evidence is there. You can ignore it. You can deny it. You can pretend it's not real, but it's there. But just proving there's a God, what, is that, what good does that do? What good does it do? Okay, there's a God. All right, I believe there's a supreme being. But do you know him? Do you have a relationship with him? Is he in control of your life? Are you living out the purpose he put you on this earth for? None of those things can be true of you if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. Because this God, this God who created all of this just by speaking, this God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to become a God-man who walked among us, lived among us, died for us, came back from the grave, and one day is coming again for us so that we can live forever with him in the universe that he created. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I just want to encourage you to do that. It's not hard. All you got to do is just admit to God you're a sinner and you need a Savior. And all you have to do is just believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess him as your Lord, believing in your heart that God did raise him from the dead. And the Apostle Paul said, if you do that, you will be saved. If you really confess, that means agree with, surrender to. If you really confess Jesus is Lord, you really believe in your heart that God raised the dead, and you surrender your life to him, you will be saved. I am so thankful you joined us for today's broadcast, and I pray this message spoke to you right where you are. Can't believe it. But did you realize Mother's Day is right around the corner again? I know there are a lot of praying mothers out there who have spent many days and nights in prayer for their children and their families. What will we do without prayer warrior moms in this world? So if you're looking for the perfect, uplifting, and inspiring gift to celebrate the mothers in your life, I would love for you to consider giving my new book on prayer, The God Who Hears. For a gift of any amount, you can receive a copy of this book, which also comes with a free downloadable four-week Bible study guide. Head to the link on the screen right now to get a copy of this unique and encouraging gift for the incredible women of God in your life. When you turn on the news these days, you quickly realize our world's in serious trouble. People need Jesus like never before. If you're a believer, you've got to work extra hard to stand firm and stay strong in these troubling times. I've heard it said that without action, the best intentions in the world are nothing more than that, intentions. So I want to give you three actionable tools designed to intentionally deepen your faith. Number one, you can enroll in our daily devotion email. Each day we provide you with an encouraging word and targeted prayers to make sure you're ready to face the day. You can sign up at touchinglives.org. 
Number two, you can download our Touching Lives app where we have a library of sermons and daily inspiration and you can even receive prayer for whatever you're facing. It's available in the App Store now on every device. And finally, number three, you can follow Touching Lives on social media, including Instagram and YouTube. This year, we added a boatload of encouraging videos and inspirational quotes that are easy to share with your friends and family. Thank you again for being a part of the TL family. May God bless you richly so that this would be one of your best and most blessed years yet for the glory of God. Touching the lives of the lost and enriching the faith of the found. This is Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. This broadcast is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.